Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. We have apologies uh, from Lord Peter Smith, uh, Councillor David Molyneux, uh, attending in Peter's place, and late apologies from Councillor Alex Gnotis. Um, Alex uh, and his partner uh, are celebrating the birth of their son, uh, William, so I'm sure uh, on behalf of everybody, we send our warmest uh, wishes uh, to them both and to, to all, all of the family. Uh, Councillor Wendy Wild, yeah, attending uh, for Stockport. Item two, chair's announcements and urgent business. Um, I know, like me, you will all be thinking uh, about the uh, anniversary of the attack on the arena, and particularly about the families and everybody affected uh, as we get towards this, uh, uh, this very, very emotional uh, time. W with that in mind, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to invite um, Sir Richard Lees to update uh, the combined authority on arrangements uh, for uh, the, um, the anniversary, the, 20, the um, 22nd of May, and the uh, arrangements that the City Council have put in place for the first anniversary of the attack. Richard. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, the first anniversary is uh, always a, a very uh, emotional uh, moment. And I, th I think the commemoration will f start the weekend before uh, May the 22nd, when we have the City Games and the Great, uh, Great Manchester uh, run. And uh, members will recall that last year that was the weekend immediately uh, after uh, the bombing at the arena and was a very, very important event in, in terms of demonstrating uh, defiance and togetherness across Manchester. And I think that will be reflected within the uh, Greater Manchester run uh, one, one year on. Uh, on May the 22nd itself, uh, as always, uh, the most important thing to us, the thing we think about first are the bereaved, uh, those who've had life-changing injuries, and the thousands of people who are still living with the trauma of what happened uh, 12 months uh, uh, ago. The heart of that part will be a, a, a memorial service at Manchester Cathedral. Representatives from all the districts will be invited to that memorial uh, uh, s uh, service. And that will be at uh, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon of uh, May the 22nd. Uh, there will be a national minute silence on May the 22nd. That will take place at 2.30. Uh, so that that will be uh, clearly in the middle of that memorial uh, service. It will be paused for that period of time. Uh, the memorial service is uh, being screened also. It's, it's being uh, uh, broadcast in uh, Liverpool Cathedral, in York Cathedral, in Glasgow Cathedral, because clearly uh, a lot of those that were at the uh, concert came from all over the, the country, so there is an opportunity for uh, people to share the commemoration uh, at other those other locations. And in terms of, uh, uh, it may well be that the cathedral cannot hold all the people who would want to take part. There will also be a screening in cathedral gardens in the city centre uh, as, as well. Um, the, we, we know that there are a whole range of organisations that uh, uh, will be organising events to commemorate what happened on May the 2nd. And uh, we're neither encouraging nor discouraging uh, uh, those. What, uh, what I'm just talking about is what the is the official programme, uh, as well as the commemoration service. We also wanted something that uh, really celebrated Manchester together and the way that communities did come out uh, in defiance and solidarity, and gave very clear messages that we weren't going to change the way we live our lives, that we weren't going to allow terrorism to uh, uh, to win. And uh, there is, will be an evening event in Albert Square. Uh, I, I suppose uh, probably the easiest way of describing it is a sing-along in Albert Square. Uh, choirs are being invited to take part. Uh, people have been invited to submit songs that they'd like to have sung at that, uh, that ev event. So there will be performances from a whole range of choirs uh, together. And for s elements of it, people will be well invited to join in uh, that, that event. And that, uh, that is an event that's really about the city and its people rather than, uh, rather than the, the victims of the, uh, the atrocity at the arena. Because, again, we thought it was important to uh, really celebrate uh, 
I think how Ma Manchester did come together after what was uh, an awful event. At 10.31 on the evening of the May the 22nd, the bells in churches uh, and the town hall will be all rung at that point to uh, mark uh, the actual time of the uh, bomb. And the other of official part of the programme, starting on the 22nd, is that there are going to be uh, song lyrics that will be uh, basically uh, shone onto the uh, St. Anne's Square, on, onto the buildings uh, there. Again, that's something where people have been asked to say, what are what the lyrics that you want to have up there to reflect your feelings about what happened uh, a year ago? So it's a mixture, I, th I think, of certainly of some uh, appropriate solemnity uh, in marking the tragic loss of life and those that uh, were uh, seriously injured or, and actually uh, those people who suffer mental as well as physical healings, there'll be that part of it, but there will also be a, a celebration of what Manchester is uh, all about and how the city responded to that atrocity. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Richard. Um, obviously, uh, it'll be a difficult time for everybody, but sounds like very appropriate arrangements have been put in place and the two main events will, will complement uh, each other uh, very well. So thank you very much for that update. Um, I also wanted to uh, say something about the news we've received since the last combined authority regarding um, the redundancies at Shop Direct. This um, sadly has affected uh, almost 2,000 people uh, in Greater Manchester, principally uh, in Oldham, but also at sites um, uh, in Oldham, uh, so at Rochdale and Salford um, as well. If perhaps it was a, a different industry, the car industry, I think maybe there would have been much more uh, attention um, on this issue. Uh, but certainly from a Greater Manchester level, I would want to assure everybody affected, <coughs> that their families and those communities, that, that we are uh, giving our full attention uh, to supporting uh, to supporting them, uh, together with um, uh, leaders from uh, Oldham, uh, Salford, and others, other colleagues, we um, we met with Shop Direct uh, just over a week ago, and uh, put forward counter proposals to see if we could keep the company here in Greater Manchester. Uh, sadly, there was no real uh, willingness to engage with that with that discussion. However, the company have agreed to join a task force uh, which I have asked the Manchester Growth Company to, to establish to look at potential use of the sites that might uh, ultimately be vacated as well as support for uh, individuals uh, potentially facing uh, redundancy. So that, that is uh, being set up and we'll be able to provide uh, support. So obviously a, a difficult issue but just wanted to, um, uh, to, to assure colleagues that uh, we have done everything that we can uh, to provide people with, with the help that they will no doubt uh, be needing. Anybody would like to come in? Jean? Clearly this was a bombshell announcement um, and they announced it at the same time. The company announced it at the pretty much the same time as they um, issued their press release and they made contact with leaders in the areas that were affected at the same time as they were issuing a press release, which it, I think was quite a cynical move, really. And I think it, it, it is a cynical, a whole cynical approach to this. It was absolutely clear that they'd made no attempt whatsoever to look for an alternative site in the Northwest, and we could have found them one, but they made no attempt at all to look for an alternative site that would come available in the time scale of two years that they're looking at. Um, it, they're starting on site in May in the new East, East Midlands site, so they've clearly been contractually obliged for quite some time to, to that arrangement. Um, I met with the trade unions before I met with Shop Direct. I met with them separately. Um, I think they were already clear that whilst we should try to persuade them to look for a site in the northwest, that was probably not going to happen. Uh, so the priority now, as Andy says, is to do absolutely everything we possibly can to support the people who will be affected in terms of being made redundant. Um, and we will do that through our own Get Old and Working team and also with the support of the growth company. Um, as um, Andy touched upon, this impacts also on the 
community of Shaw, the tight-knit community of Shaw, because losing that many employees from that location will impact on the businesses in that area. Um, so again, one of the things that we've already, we then met with Shop Direct themselves, made our feelings very, very clear. I made my feelings very, very clear about the way that they'd approached this. Um, but from a pragmatic point of view, accepted then that we are where we are and that we will do what we can to support them, to support their employees, but also to support them to find an alternative use. So our regeneration team is on with looking for um, other, other companies that would want to occupy that site. At the same time, whenever we're talking to companies who want to relocate to Oldham, who are in that kind of business, we will be um, suggesting to them that we've got a ready-made workforce um, and we'll be encouraging them to take as many of those people on as possible. Thanks very much, uh, Jean. Uh, City Mayor of Salford. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think how this has been handled has been fairly disgraceful, if I'm honest with you. Um, obviously, the first we got to know was when you got to know, and you know, I'd just like to thank you, Andy, really, for calling an urgent meeting to meet with representatives of Shop Direct. Shop Direct in Salford, it's approximately 100 jobs we're talking about, but for me, it's the location of those jobs in the city of Salford which is really important because they serve a community which, according to the government's own indices of multiple deprivation, is, is, is struggling. You know, we don't have a lot of jobs in that area of the city. So now, increasingly, people in Little Halton are going to be expected to travel to goodness knows where to actually find employment. Um, it was really, really worrying when we met the many of the directors of Shop Direct that, quite clearly, they'd been doing an awful lot of work behind the scenes to actually determine their new location in the East Midlands. And they've been doing this in total isolation from the workforce, from the trade unions, and also from ourselves as political leaders. Now, for an organization that clearly has its genesis in the Northwest and the North, and also has a significant customer base in the North and Scotland, I just find this deeply, deeply concerning. We could have had early conversations with this organization about you know, logistics and the strategic sites across Greater Manchester that could have met their needs, but we were never, ever given that opportunity. I mean, I'm really worried moving forward, and one of the things I certainly raised at the meeting was, you know, the number of agency workers that Shop Direct actually employed does concern me because they potentially will be dealt with in a different way in terms of consultation and engagement and what their statutory rights are as we go through this process. But for me, you know, I'd just like to thank you for calling that urgent meeting because it is deeply concerning that an organization that has its roots in the north can actually behave like this. And clearly, the overriding factor from what I can see is, is bottom line profitability that's driving this because the future is that this organization will shrink its workforce to a third of its current size in terms of its Greater Manchester operation and it'll be fully embracing automation in the East Midlands. And as far as we understand, they've already done a deal in the East Midlands where there'll be significant levels of capital investment to realize this new logistics hub which is, is going to be by and large automated. I mean. I just thank you for what you've done, but I mean, if we can continue to work with obviously the, the staff and the families, then that's absolutely critical because it's clear Shop Direct aren't interested in working with us on this issue. Thanks, Paul. Well, I'd like to, to thank you both for the support you've, you've given principally to those affected, but also to us in, in trying to move things uh, forward. Uh, I think you've both put it very well. You know, Greater Manchester works in an open and constructive way with, with all of our employers and I think it is fair to say we do expect better when we work in the way that we do I think we are entitled to at least an opportunity to discuss the issues and, and put forward a greater Manchester solution uh, before as Jean rightly said this bombshell uh, is dropped uh, on people but I would just from the chair want to give you both an assurance and the communities you represent that we will do whatever we can from the greater Manchester level to, uh, to, to uh, ensure that those communities are not um, adversely affected in the way that, 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 that they might be and that all, uh, all potential help will be, will be provided. But uh, we'll obviously continue to update the, the CA on this uh, matter as, the, as the, uh, the issue progresses. Thank you both. Um, just a couple of quick further announcements. Uh, you may well uh, be aware that another anniversary is looming and that is 
the anniversary of my taking office on uh, on May the 8th. Uh, it, to me, it feels longer than a year, but I guess it feels even longer than that to all of you. Um, but uh, we are making progress, and to demonstrate how far we've come, there'll be an event um, on the 8th of May at the Sharp Project uh, to recap where we've gone on rough sleeping over the last year, uh, recognising that we've really begun to develop a very, very strong partnership, much further to go, but we want to ensure that um, the public are aware of, of the progress that is being uh, made, and you'll all be warmly invited to that. One, one final announcement is just to remind colleagues that tomorrow is Workers' uh, Memorial Day. This is a, an international uh, commemoration around the world of, of people who have died uh, in the line of their work, and it seems appropriate to mention that this morning uh, at the um, GMFRS uh, Fire Service uh, Training Centre. Uh, we do uh, remember this morning uh, Stephen Hunt, uh, who, uh, who died uh, in the line of his work uh, fighting a fire in, in the city centre. Of course, we remember Fiona Bone and Nicola uh, Hughes, uh, too, who died in 2012, protecting uh, the Greater Manchester uh, public. And also, all of those affected by um, asbestos, the remains of a, a very large number of people who've suffered mesothelioma, other diseases, in the, line of their, in the line of their work. And of course, we have a very strong campaign here in Greater Manchester supporting families affected in that way. And, uh, and we, we offer them our support today. So uh, just wanted to, uh, to bring that to colleagues' attention. And um, it, it will, of course, be marked in the appropriate way here in Greater Manchester. Okay, moving on, uh, colleagues. Um, item three, declarations of interest. Uh, they should be declared in the uh, normal, uh, normal way. Item four, minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of March. Are they approved? Thank you, colleagues. Item five, GMCA overview and scrutiny committee minutes. Here we have minutes from the Economy, Business, Growth and Skills Committee uh, meeting on the 13th of April for noting. The Housing Planning Environment Committee was cancelled and didn't uh, take place. Uh, but then we also have Corporate Issues and Reform Committee minutes from the 18th of April. Uh, are they noted? Thank you. Item 6, GMCA Audit uh, Committee uh, minutes, which are attached. They are also for noting. Thank you. Uh, item 7, um, Greater Manchester Strategy Implementation Plan and Performance Management uh, Framework. Uh, colleagues will know that one, one of our big achievements over the last year was to set out that overarching uh, vision uh, for uh, Greater Manchester in the, uh, the Greater Manchester Strategy, our, our people, uh, our place. And it, it really does um, encapsulate everything that we're trying uh, to do, to build a, an economy here that works for everybody that leaves no person, no place uh, behind uh, an inclusive, uh, fair, diverse Greater Manchester. Uh, and what this uh, implementation plan to do, seeks to do is to ensure that we are building that Greater Manchester model of public services. And we're about to hear more from Donna Hall in the moment, place-based, person-centred public services where we work to, to break down the silos between our uh, public services, work hand in hand with the communities uh, and the voluntary uh, sector. Um, but also be very, very clear about what are the milestones towards this vision, what are the specifics that we're, uh, we're committing uh, uh, to do. And colleagues will see that they are set out uh, in, uh, in the implementation uh, plan. Uh, challenges around school readiness, improving the rates of school readiness in Greater Manchester and, and reducing the around 13,000 kids who arrive in reception class not currently school ready. We need to get that, that number down, improving levels of, of life readiness and giving all of our teenagers hope uh, for, uh, for the future. Um, we have already uh, spoken of the need to end rough sleeping, the need for rough sleeping in Greater Manchester by 2020. That's a, a shared plan uh, for, uh, for us all. The, the plan works through a whole range of, of, of uh, specific uh, commitments to ensure that we're delivering um, the uh, the Greater Manchester strategy in spirit and in and in letter, uh, and I think it will allow the Greater Manchester public to hold us directly to account uh, for what we are what we are doing 
in line with that uh, plan. This uh, implementation plan has been through uh, the overview uh, and scrutiny uh, process and comments have been received uh, from those uh, committees and in some cases acted upon and improved. Uh, so we believe that this, um, this implementation plan uh, is good to go and as, as chair of the combined authority I would want to, uh, uh, to recommend it to you. Anybody want to come in? If not, let's get on with the job and uh, get it implemented. So uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Linked to this item, uh, we have uh, item 7A, uh, person and community-centred approaches. Um, in uh, the absence of Peter Smith this morning, I'm going to invite uh, Donna Hall, Chief Executive of Wigan Council, uh, to, uh, to give us a, a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I'll mark their homework later. <laughs>
is somebody who comes in um, with low mood, immediately antidepressants, looking at what is going on within your local community in that local place and plugging them into some of the things that they could um, they could do which don't cost anything, which actually help them long term in a much better way. I'm sure people already know if you're obese, you've got um, around about a 30% chance of living um, your living to your full life expectancy. If you are socially isolated and lonely, it goes up to 50%. So this is to really tackle as well the underlying issues of social isolation and loneliness that very often we don't tackle collectively as a, as a system. So the evidence and benefits that we, uh, we need to gather are based on research that we've already done. We've been doing this over the last six months and we've found out that people spend, people with long-term complex conditions, spend about four hours on average in a year with their health or care or council professional but they spend around almost um, 9,000 hours with their families in their local community. So why are we not using that hidden resource to try to help them, support them, to be more self-reliant, to be more resilient, and to lead happier and healthier lives? So the evidence has shown that 24% um, lower attendance at A&E if we do this stuff, and a 28% reduction in need for GP services. But it isn't just exclusive to health. So in Wigan, for example, we've now got a balanced social care budget um, which is great news at last. It's taken us six years, hasn't it, David, to get there. But it's because we've been relentless with doing this stuff across the board. And I know you're doing similar things within all of your different places. So making sure we try to bring our public service reform agenda in with our local care organisations so we don't see them as two separate things. It's all part of place-based ambition. And linking that in with the way that hospitals function as well. Um, and making sure that they don't just see people as little clinical units of need. So what we're proposing to you today, and I hope you, um, you all, you're all in favour of supporting it, is a bespoke offer for every locality, working in detail with you, not trying to take away what you've already developed through your own system models, but really building on it and trying to roll out good practice across Greater Manchester. Making Greater Manchester the uh, place for person and community-centred approaches. I think it already is, to be honest, Andy, at the moment, in the whole of the UK. People are looking to us for the answers on this and making sure that we try to address some of the underlying factors and barriers to doing this, whether it's short-term need within acute sectors or whether it's a lack of IT or data sharing protocols across different partner organisations or a basic lack of money to invest in, in transformation up front. Um, so these are the areas we're going to be looking at, uh, in particular people with a learning disability, older people with multiple long-term conditions and people at the end of life. So it does fit in with our GMS 10 strategic objectives. I'd just like to show you a short film just to show how it's actually working in, in our Hello, place. my name is Linda Romeo, nice. and I'm the Chief Social Worker for Adults in the Department of Health and Social Care. Each year, I write an annual report which reflects on what I've achieved in the last 12 months, but also what is the emerging best practice out there in the sector. I was privileged this year to spend a day at Wigan Council hearing about and engaging with the story of the practice changes they have made in working with individuals and communities using an asset and strengths based approach. I was pleased when they agreed to have this film made about what they've been doing and the journey they've been on. I think it really exemplifies the best in social work. I hope you enjoy the film and I hope that it inspires you to think about ways in which you too could think about a more strengths-based social work practice approach in your organisation. The deal to me is a movement that is specific to Wigan and it kind of, it involves both the people that work for the council but also the wider community and the residents that, that live in the borough as well. So for us there's obviously our, our employee behaviours which is be positive, courageous and accountable and it just gives us that ability to work differently. I think one of the key principles is having a new conversation with the individuals that you're working with and that is a really simple concept in that you literally just asking the person what they want to achieve and what they want in their lives um, and having a new conversation with that individual gives them control and it also enables us to have um, those different conversations in terms of looking at alternative ways, creative ways that we can meet needs as opposed to traditional ways, things like putting a home care package in. So for example, I'm currently working with um, a male at the moment. Um, he had quite a severe stroke in 
2014, I think it was, um, and that severely affected his mobility and speech. And around about six months ago, I became involved with Carl um, to reassess him. He no longer had nursing needs um, and he expressed a wish to, to move back into the community, into independent living. It's really difficult to try to assess somebody to live in a setting that you've never seen them live in. Um, so going from nursing care into independent living, um, we had to really look at um, things around positive risk taking as opposed to um, sort of being risk averse, which is a traditional way of working in social work. He's happy, he's doing doing the things that he wants to do and he's got what, got he, got what he wanted. So how do you feel your life's changed since we started working together? It's been a lot better, a lot easier yeah. for me. Good. Give me more confidence. But what was life like before you came to work for you? Miserable. Very. And no no one to have a chat to. No one to chat to. No. But here, we've got other residents mm -hmm. and their staff. What other things are you able to do now that you've moved here? I have more freedom. I can go, go out where I want, come back where I want. Mm -hmm. And this time, a lot better. So how important do you think it is for us to know and understand our community? So we've recently just gone to a place-based model of working and it's absolutely fantastic because we're working in our factories. We know our housing, we know our police, we know our education, we know our community groups, we know our volunteering groups. So when we're working with somebody, we can really get to know somebody. What's their aspirations? What's their strengths? What do they enjoy doing? And then looking in the community and what can we link up? with to promote positive outcomes for that person. So there's so much happening in the community, there's all different groups and community interest groups and all different hubs that people of the community um, can you know, link into. Um, Sunshine House has been a really big success for Wigan Council um, and the residents of Wigan Council. There's so many different activities going on from anything from benefit advice to painting classes to you know, just going for your dinner. So one of our new resources is the community book and what we can do with that is when somebody's telling us what they like and what they want to do, we can straight away look on the community book and look for all different groups, activities, even events, you know, nights out and celebrations too and we can share that with the person in the home with our surface pros and then look to see how we can support that person in, in getting there and doing what they want to do. next to the rugby league club that is reaching out to supporters with dementia. Wigan Warriors have set up a rugby memories group where fans of the team meet up once a week to watch an old game and reminisce about the glory days. The club hopes the scheme will also help tackle loneliness in the community. Chris Hall went along to this week's meeting where a very special guest dropped by. I first went when I was 17 oh, to yeah. watch Wigan, and yeah, I'm 89 I now, so I've served yeah. my apprenticeship. <laughs> Mary and Lily share more than a love yeah. of rugby league. Both have dementia and met after losing their husbands, but they found comfort remembering the other men in their lives, those wearing cherry and white. My favourite memory was um, Billy Boston, Eric Ashton, Johnny Lawson, do you remember Johnny Lawson? Reminiscing about their favourite players isn't just nostalgic, it's therapeutic. 
here at the Fur Clemps Cafe in the heart of Wigan Warriors HQ. A rugby memories group is open to anyone with and without dementia to protect against loneliness and social withdrawal. They really come to life when they start to tell their stories about when they first started to watch the rugby. We have the old programmes, we have old photographs. Today some of the ladies brought their own photographs and shared those with the group. So it just brings those memories to life. Especially when their favourite player, John Bateman, pops in to say hello. <laughs> and invites them to watch his next match from the comfort of a corporate box. <laughs> I'll never speak, you know. <laughs> and I'll never wash my face. That was brilliant. Best, bit, best day of my life. <laughs> never forget it. Never forget it, will we? Can't wait for the 11th. We're in a box, aren't we? I'm going to go like this. <laughs> I'm not going to be drinking tea. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> They've cheered Wigan to dozens of trophies, but those memories are slowly being taken away. Dementia is growing in the UK. 850,000 have it now. By the time John Bateman is in his 30s, one million of us will have it, enough to fill the DW Stadium 40 times over. So the Warriors are sending their young players to these sessions to learn how to care for those with dementia and to get tips on tackling technique. It does more tackling than anybody in rugby league. Yeah. For goodness sake, get the legs, you can't go without the legs. Yeah, she'll tell me to tackle the legs because I can't run without the legs, so I'll have to go back to training and tell the lads. So, yeah, it was good to come and see people like this and see how much it means to them, obviously, just to put a smile on their face and sit and ju just for her to turn around and say it was fantastic and one of the best days she's had. You know what I mean? It just it means a lot and it is, it's fantastic to see people like that. John Bateman is our favourite player. Oh, is it? He will be when they go to watch him. He's in the memory-making business to keep the smiles on these faces. Chris Hall, ITV News, Wigan. What a great Wonderful. pair. Mary and Lily, you are superstars. We love you. You need to get them in the dressing room. Absolutely. Now, still to come. I think we need a Donna video at every uh, uh, meeting of the, the CA to, l to lift our uh, spirits. But that was brilliant, Donna. Thank you uh, very much. Richard. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, uh, Andy. That it was brilliant. Thanks, uh, Donna. And thanks for e everybody else that's uh, put that uh, together. A uh, slight little niggle. It was this problem of uh, reminding myself I'm a mathematician. Your, your 8,756 hours does include the time that we're normally asleep. So, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> so it's probably not quite that much, uh, 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 really. Uh, in terms of the films, I, I'd, uh, if they, they're available, because I'd love to share those with other people, because I, I think the, the films do tell a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, story. Uh, and there's some bits in it. I love it that Wigan Warriors have got a health and well-being uh, manager. I think that says a lot ju uh, uh, just on its own. Uh, I think it helps because a lot of this is about sharing decision making in a way that is perhaps, uh, well, traditionally quite alien to local government, really, and actually a bit alien to councillors uh, as well. So I, I think material that helps us uh, sell that to uh, people, I think, is, is really, really important. But I think it's also a timely reminder that if we go back to 2014 and particularly when we're talking about the health and social care aspects of, of devolution, that this is really what it's all about. 
Uh, what it's all about, for, is particularly for those people with higher level of needs, was the ability to be able to integrate and deliver services in a completely uh, uh, different way. That's what the objective is. And I think what this demonstrates is that it can be done. But I do think, because it's long and hard to make these changes, I know you know, y you've talked to us in Manchester about the, the length of the journey in Wigan to get to where you are now. And w long, hard journeys, we do need constant reminders of the benefits we get from going on that, that journey. And I think this material will help enormously. In terms of the support, uh, really, really important. Again, I know uh, in Manchester, we want to be able to get to where we are now without support from uh, Wigan. The p to be able to get help, to help each other, to be able to support each other is really, really important. So I think, uh, again, the assistance pa package that uh, you're putting forward, I think I'd, I'd certainly want to endorse and very, very welcome. Well said, Rich. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Bev. Uh, thank, thank you, Andy. Oh, thank you for that presentation, Donna. It was absolutely fantastic, and also the work uh, that, that's gone behind it. Um, as chance would have it, I was spent yesterday afternoon in Wigan <laughs> talking to a variety of professionals from right across uh, health and social care and police uh, sectors uh, working together in one of the service delivery footprint areas and got a real sense of the you know the commitment to the integration that that is there now and also uh, talked to the the mash team too um, and, and I think that the person duty centered approach is is is, a, is an absolutely essential and um, next step from the place-based public sector reform model that uh, we're all trying to work work towards um, and I support it really strongly um, I just wanted to ask a particular question in terms of the the areas of bespoke support that you're proposing um, districts look at in terms of accessing um, GM support the the care planning the integrated personal budget social prescribing asset based approaches I think certainly for some people um, with chronic conditions or uh, long-term disabilities where in, you know, helping them to maintain their independence, but in a socially um, nurturing way, so they're not isolated. I think there's real potential for the use of digital technology um, to help that. And I, I think that may take us another step forward. And so I just wondered if actually we could include that as kind of one of the elements we might be looking for as districts develop their own um, uh, plans on, on person and community centred approaches. Donna? In a word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like to come in? Well, really, that was an excellent presentation, Donna. And um, I, I think it really captures where we're at uh, here in Greater Manchester. And as you say, it's a, it's a leadership position. It's truly groundbreaking what we're trying to do here and we shouldn't underestimate that um, and if we can make it work here then I think we will as Richard said not just give help and hope to each other in terms of how we develop this but to other other places as well I've long said that there's a simple test actually for when we'll know whether we've got a 21st century NHS and for me it's when we can say that it supports people with dementia as well as it currently treats cancer now we can't say that yet, but I think we're on the way to be able to saying it here. Uh, but of course, there's, there's some considerable further way to go. But as the video brought through, it's not just better for the public to apply this person-centered, place-based approach. It's better for the staff working in our public services, because they said it. It, it. It's more rewarding for them uh, to work in this way, rather than just individually dealing with the problem, but not the person behind the problem, they can actually come together and actually do something much more meaningful uh, for people so I, I, I am in no doubt we're on the right lines and speaking as a former Wigan Borough MP I know how much this sea change that's underway is down to you personally because of the change that you instituted uh, at, um, at Wigan Council I saw it for myself and um, it, it was truly uh, you know inspirational to see a kind of approach that starts with people and communities trusts our communities and and helps build from those strengths and uh, it is now very that approach is very much the foundation stone for everything we're doing here in Greater Manchester so thank you very much indeed uh, Donna okay moving on to slightly less uh, cheery matters Richard Brexit report 
thanks, Chair. I think just three comments uh, I, I'd, I'd want to make. Uh, one, I think, is uh, probably a positive. We don't get too many positives around Brexit, which and it, it's uh, not contained directly within the report, but at least there's some indications now that something that's been an objective for a long time, which is that Greater Manchester companies are now looking far more positively for opportunities to international trade, just as it's becoming more difficult to do so. But the fact that they're looking, I think, is, uh, uh, is very, very positive. Clearly, uh, there have been a number of big debates going on, but the biggest has been around uh, customs union and uh, particularly related to the uh, Irish border uh, question. Uh, a, a major and I think very welcome defeat for government in the uh, House of Lords and uh, clearly that, that uh, doesn't mean a vast amount but I, th I think it, it does give a very clear indication of uh, support within Parliament uh, that we do need to be able to maintain our ability to trade freely with the rest of Europe and customs union is one way of being able to uh, do that. Uh, clearly, where we will end up is yet yet to be uh, yet to be seen, and because uh, it's it's uh, still a few months before we get the package that uh, government will want to put, put before Parliament to approve. Uh, last thing I'd say is that we we do have to be uh, planning for uh, what happens post 2019, and particularly what happens uh, post 2021 when existing European funding uh, arrangements come to an end. Uh, as we start developing uh, our local industrial strategy, recognise that currently European funding, uh, both structural funding and, uh, and other transnational programmes, have been a very important, uh, very financially significant element of what we've been able to do to grow our economy over the uh, past period of time. Uh, government have proposed to replace that with a shared prosperity fund, uh, but at the moment of it, all we have are the words shared prosperity fund. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know the extent to which it will be devolved. Uh, we don't know whether uh, it will, as we've asked for, have a greater set of local flexibility and devolution than, than exists with existing European funding. And we really need to have that information sooner rather than later in order to be able to uh, put together uh, an effective strategy. And one of the things that Europe did give us was effectively a guarantee of six years funding. Uh, that guarantee means you can do uh, the sort of planning that you can't do when you effectively get random annual funding pots when you don't know how much they're going to be and you don't know whether you're going to get them or not. And I think we need, need to make the case that if we are going to survive uh, uh, Brexit, that we need to be able to do long-term coherent economic planning at a local level to make sure that uh, our economy does not suffer unnecessarily from the impact of Brexit. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Any, um, any questions, comments? Just to echo from the chair what Richard just said, um, it's very important that the government provide clarity soon on the, the shared prosperity fund. Two things I would say. Firstly, that it should mean that Greater Manchester has funding at the same level that we receive uh, as a result of European funding and including the top-ups that come with it from UK government. And secondly, that we have flexibility over that funding to support the development of our local industrial uh, strategy, as Richard said. Uh, the outlook is a little uncertain, but you know I think we need to bear in mind uh, that, that this uh, city region is shown still signs of considerable growth. Recently judged the fastest growing city uh, in the in the UK. People can see that when they look at the amount of, of building work taking place across the city. And though we've kind of had the bad news of Shop Direct, which we've touched on today, I think it's appropriate at this point uh, to point to the recent announcement from GCHQ that they will be uh, uh, establishing uh, a base in the city, which I would say is a major vote of confidence uh, in um, in us, in our plans to build a digital uh, city region. And I think it was particularly telling that they pointed to the response of Greater Manchester after the arena attack uh, last year as the best possible way of fighting extremism and terrorism. So that, that was a, you know, a huge coup, I would say, for Greater Manchester and due in no small part uh, to, um, to the efforts of, of you, uh, Richard, uh, to, to, uh, to bring them here. So the picture does remain uncertain, and that's why it's, it's up to the UK government to keep providing us with more and more clarity over the future so that we can get on and build uh, the, um, the, the Greater Manchester economy 
post, uh, post Brexit. Thank you. Item 9, National Planning Policy Framework Consultation Proposals, Paul Dennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is here in, in light of the fact that the government are consulting at the moment on the National Planning Policy Framework. The recommendations before the combined authority are to obviously endorse the combined authority's response to the consultation and to delegate final approval to both myself and also the Chief Executive, Eamon Boylan. Um, the revisions were published on the 5th of March of, of this year and the consultation actually ends on the 10th of May of this year. Um, in addition to the consultation on the National Planning Policy Framework, the government are also simultaneously consulting on reforms to developer contributions. So they're known as the Community Infrastructure Levy and the Section 106 agreements, which I'm sure we're all aware of in, in this room. Um, what the Combined Authority proposes to do is to respond to the 43 detailed questions that the government are asking as part of the consultation. And we're also going to submit a more strategic response. And the, the letter is from myself is appended to this, this report. Um, in terms of the consultation itself, I think we welcome a number of things that are outlined in that, some of them being that government are endorsing a plan-led approach. They're also talking about the standardised methodology for calculating local housing need and a standardised approach to viability assessments. I think all of those things we certainly welcome here within Greater Manchester. However, I would like to draw the combined authorities' attention to some of our concerns, certainly within the consultation document namely the lack of alignment with DEFRA's 25-year strategic plan and the weakening of protection for locally important wildlife sites. That is a real issue for us here in Greater Manchester and we are proposing to make representation on, on that issue. Also, we're concerned about the changes to the definition of what can be included in the five-year housing supply and the implications of that for new homes bonus calculations and obviously the relationship between new homes bonus and local government financing. Um, we know certainly in the city of Salford that even though we're building homes quite often when there are changes to m national methodologies, you quite often get penalised. I think we lost somewhere in the region of three million pounds um, only a few years ago because of changes to the new homes bonus calculations. So we are really concerned about that, that definition change around five year housing supply. Also, the NPAPF consultation seems to penalise local authorities for non-delivery when actually some of the issues potentially may, li may lie in the industry itself, either its inability to deliver homes or its unwillingness to deliver homes. And I say unwillingness because we are aware that some of the, the big house builders in the country are turning around and saying to the government at the moment that they're not prepared to increase housing supply. So this is clearly a big issue and there seems to be a bit of a standoff at the moment between the government and the housing industry. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. I guess what we're saying in our response here though is because of that, you know, local authorities shouldn't be penalised. Also, there seems to be a real lack of concern from certainly in my opinion with the issue of affordable housing within the consultation on MPPF. MPPF talks about 10%, a threshold of 10% of home ownership, not rental or what do we mean by affordability? That isn't seemingly explored at all within the consultation document. And I'm certainly aware that when we often talk about affordability, what we're looking at is the housing market and 80% of the housing market being deemed affordable. There is no relationship whatsoever with what's happening in the labour market and what income households are obviously struggling with at the moment to make ends meet. So I've got real concerns with how the government are proposing to tackle the affordability issue and also we are aware that there's still the ongoing live issue w within Greater Manchester certainly about Homes England not releasing grant to enable us to build homes for, for social rent. So, And that's at the same time when governments seem quite relaxed about doing a £70 million deal with Cambridge City Council to build council houses because they perceive the, the housing market as overheating over there when average house prices are around £450,000. So you can see that the, we've got some real concerns, certainly in terms of the consultation as it stands currently, and we propose to make our representations on, on that basis. So it's here for, for noting, obviously, and also to delegate approval to myself and, and Eamon Boylan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I think those concerns are articulated very clearly in the uh, proposed 
response. The question for the CA this morning is whether uh, we are uh, ready to endorse uh, that, um, that uh, suggested response and also to delegate the final agreement of the text to, uh, to Paul and the, uh, and the lead uh, chief executive. There's a 10th of May deadline on, the, um, on, on this. Any colleagues want to come in on this item? I think, Paul, you have spoken for all of us. I think they, they are our concerns, and um, uh, we would give you now full backing in uh, expressing them as, as forcefully as you, as you can uh, back, to, uh, back to the government. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Colleagues, uh, we move on to item 10, devolved transport funding, uh, including highways funding and an update there on congestion uh, deal funding. Um, a year in, I'm quite clear that transport is one of uh, the issues that could potentially hold Greater Manchester back if we don't uh, succeed in getting significant investment, not just in our in our roads, but in in all modes uh, all modes of transport. Um, you have a package uh, of funding that is uh, is is set out here. Um, I think it's important for me to say at the beginning that this actually though doesn't uh, in any way rise to the scale of our challenge. Particularly there's uh, two pots of funding on potholes, which I think uh, people will probably welcome as far as it goes. But I think it's, it's, it's important to say just how far away uh, the proposed allocations are from the actual uh, uh, need that we have uh, in, uh, in Greater Manchester. Uh, a recent survey uh, of road condition, the Local Authority Road Maintenance Survey 2018, found that the uh, uh, backlog, if you like, of repairs is £9.3 billion nationally, uh, £55 million on average for each local authority, but for northern uh, authorities, the figure is judged to be uh, £65 um, million pounds per authority. Now, the public um, driving around with Grace Manchester will probably recognise that, and I think it's very important uh, that the blame doesn't necessarily all fall on our 10 at local uh, councils, the um, the backlog is far higher than the actual funding that is being proposed here, as welcome uh, as as that funding is. There are um, uh, other items that we're being asked to agree: grants to Manchester City Council and Stockport from the National Productivity uh, Investment uh, Fund, uh, funding to support the congestion uh, deal, which was uh, which was uh, announced in. In March, that's a range of measures to improve management of the highways, but also provide more incentives for companies to encourage their employees to switch from cars to public transport, vary the uh, working day uh, to relieve uh, congestion. So a whole uh, package of uh, measures, uh, including as well the funding mechanism for the payment of the integrated transport block grant, highways maintenance capital grant, and highways maintenance efficiency uh, funding. Uh, a complicated package, uh, which, as I say, doesn't necessarily meet in any way the, the scale of the transport challenge that we face, but obviously uh, important as far as it goes. Any colleagues like to come in on this? Angelique Stoiker. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, very much welcoming the entry fund uh, for Manchester and elements of the congestion deal, but I'd just like to build on your point about potholes. Before 2010, Manchester City Council was spending about 12 million per annum uh, on, uh, to keep our roads to similar standards. In the last uh, seven years, due to government cuts, we had to reduce this, this figure down to four million per year. Um, as you have said, uh, portals is an issue across the city. And on our budget consultation, um, we listened to Manchester residents who have said that um, the state of our roads is one of the top three issues in Manchester. And we have put 100 million um, to invest on our roads for the next five years in Manchester. So just to illustrate the point, um, if this year we spent about 15 million and we, sp we, we filled um, round about 15,500 portals and the equivalent of 46 football pitches. But um, this is not enough. This is nowhere near enough. We hear this on the doorstep. Uh, from our residents. The government spends round about 1.1 um, million per mile to spend 
to, on, the, on the national road network, whereas for councils, the average is uh, £21,000 per year. This is just not good enough. Uh, I don't think they have much understanding of what the need is across all of the local authorities, and it's just a drop in the ocean. Thanks, uh, Angeliki. Um, Leader of Tameside Council, Councillor Brenda Warrington. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I first of all fully endorse the comments that have just been made uh, relative to potholes? Uh, I, I think all of us suffer um, from worsening uh, effects of, of the condition of our roads across all of the authorities, and it is definitely uh, something that we hear day in and day out on the doorstep. There is a major concern, and we do have to um, address it. Uh, but my point, Chair, um, was, was really to welcome the report, to say that uh, I'm happy to agree with the recommendations uh, that are made on the report, but I would like to make an appeal uh, for future years, if you like. And it's in relation to paragraph 2.6 of the report, which details the um, integrated transport block funding. And noting that this uh, funding, the, the last time that we had a strategy was in 2009. I think perhaps in the next financial year, it will be 10 years old, and I would like to ask that uh, in advance of that, we look to review that strategy um, for the future, because we have had uh, a number uh, of quite significant changes uh, of strategy within Greater Manchester, and I, I would like to know uh, that those strategic changes are incorporated in, in that. So not for this time, uh, willing to accept it for now, for the next 12 months, but thereafter, I would like us to have had a review to see how we need to uh, look at it for future. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brenda. Any other colleagues want to come in on this item? If not, can I invite Richard Paver just to reply to Brenda's uh, point uh, just now? Yes, the, uh, the resources allocated under um, 2.6 are feeding into the Greater Manchester Transport Fund, which is the sort of multi-year um, capital programme, the billion and a half. And clearly that is something that we can keep under uh, review as to how those resources have been allocated and are progressing and how the funding's going. So, yes. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, Transport uh, is an issue that we will need to continue uh, to return to on a, on a regular basis, um, particularly given decisions looming on, on HS2 and Northern Powerhouse uh, Rail. So we will uh, continue to update the CA on progress. Um, item 11, devolution of the adult education uh, budget, report from uh, Councillor Sean Anstey. Sean. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. So this is just to update um, members of the CA with the progress in relation to adult education budget uh, devolution, which um, we'll be familiar with was known uh, a key part even of the 2014 dev devolution agreement. Uh, presently, about £80 million pounds a year uh, is spent, and um, almost the reverse, Paul, to your comments, in the calculation uh, for national calculation for mayoral combined authorities uh, that is favourable to Greater Manchester. So we're expecting in 2019-20 an allocation of £92.2 .2 million pounds of AEB. We're operating in shadow uh, form this year, so that's given us the opportunity to be able to uh, work with providers across the city region. It was originally our intention, uh, had uh, devolution happened this year, uh, to really not make any fundamental changes to the way that we uh, fund uh, providers across the city region. But having this shadow year uh, into next year is enabling us to do that. Uh, there's a requirement for us to submit a strategic skills plan to DFE as we sort of um, uh, prepare uh, to meet the readiness conditions for uh, devolution. Uh, that's not just about the adult education budget, but the wider skills system, which I think is uh, useful for us uh, to be able to understand. Um, there is quite a quick process to follow through um, June and July in relation to the orders that uh, DFE will need to uh, provide and the consent uh, that the CA and uh, 
uh, authorities will need to provide as well in the, re the report sort of outlines uh, th th those principles. And then in the annexes, it starts to talk about the functions that will be moved uh, over to us as part of the devolved environment. So I think, I think this is really good progress. There's a huge amount of work that needs to uh, take place between now and um, July uh, to be able to make sure that the orders are put in place before the summer recess. If we can get that right, then we're really shaping up um, the city region to take advantage of uh, really a key plank of devolution policy, which is you know how do we make sure that our, our adult population has the skills that it needs um, and we can respond locally to the to the demands that we see across our population. So um, the recommendations are outlined in the report and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Sean. Um, the report's very clear. And I'd just like to echo what you've just said, that this is a, a major uh, part of our devolution uh, journey. Uh, and as Sir Richard was saying earlier, a crucial part of getting a local industrial strategy that actually uh, works, having a, a skills policy to, su to support it. So uh, really crucial um, for us. And um, this paper uh, lays out very clearly the plans uh, as they're uh, proceeding for Greater Manchester to receive control of the adult education budget. A year later, it has to be said, but nevertheless, uh, uh, next, next April, April 2019. Any colleagues want to come in on this, uh, this item? If not, thank you very much, uh, Sean. Uh, that's, uh, that's agreed. Uh, and we move on to item 12, which is uh, the governance uh, review. I mentioned earlier that it's um, a year since, um, since I was elected, since the post of, of mayor fully came into effect. And of course, at that point, Greater Manchester entered into a new world when it comes to governance and accountability. Uh, some of the functions of, of, of old committees that were operational in Greater Manchester, um, notably the fire committee, transformed to the mayor and to the uh, combined uh, authority. Uh, and there has been an ongoing review over the last 12 months of, of what now are the right governance arrangements, recognising that the world has changed, but also recognising what Donna Hall was saying earlier, that you know, we need, going forward, not to think of our public services in silos, working in isolation, but obviously creating an environment in which we are encouraging them to think in a, in a place-based way about how we best support uh, support the public. So with leaders, we've been looking at those arrangements and a number of principles have guided our thinking. The first, of course, is to hold, have arrangements that hold me and you and the CA uh, to account on behalf, behalf of the Greater Manchester public. So actually there has been uh, a, an early um, uh, effort to establish new governance and scrutiny arrangements uh, to, to hold the combined authority to account. And that is actually a new layer uh, of, of scrutiny uh, in Greater Manchester. We have three uh, scrutiny, overview and scrutiny committees, uh, the minutes of which, two of which we, we, we referred to earlier. Uh, directly, they involve 45 uh, councillors uh, from the 10 districts including substitutes, it's 56 uh, individual members are involved in that work, and obviously they, that wasn't happening uh, before. And those uh, scrutiny committees do exercise a function across all uh, public services and work of the CA, including, including the fire service. Uh, they have oversight uh, in, in that area. So that, that, is a, that is a big change, and I think it has significantly strengthened accountability mechanisms uh, across uh, Greater Manchester. The second principle we've tried to put into place is to improve and streamline decision making and improve the quality of decision making. And that is done by thinking about how we encourage our public services to work together, um, particularly police and fire, um, but also how we improve the quality of decision making at the between the GM level and the district, uh, the district level. So thinking more about decision makers at local level being more involved in, in decisions then that are being taken at the GM level. So that whole effort to improve the quality of decisions uh, is, has been also guiding our thinking. And thirdly, we've, we've um, wanted to ensure that we are involving as many um, councillors as possible in the work 
of the combined authority consistent with the principles that I've, I've just outlined, with, a, with an eye, though, of course, on the cost of running, uh, of running committees and making sure that we've, we've got the balance right. So what you have before you in, in the paper is the, the conclusions of that governance uh, review, which are not yet fully complete, fully formed, uh, more so in relation to the fire committee, uh, but, but proposals beginning to emerge in the area of waste and uh, transport as well. And let me um, just take colleagues uh, briefly uh, through those uh, proposals. Um, the reason why they are being brought to this CA is, of course, if they are agreed uh, today, it, it then allows, following the uh, local elections, the new arrangements to be put into place rather than pushing things down the road and delaying things for another year. You know, we are in a new world, and it's right now to, to get on with the job of, of putting in place new arrangements to reflect that rather than double running with mayoral functions and committees and it not quite making, making sense uh, to people. So to go through the, uh, uh, the, the proposals, uh, in respect of uh, the fire uh, committee, as I've said, the big change came a year ago when the decision making was transferred from the old fire authority uh, to, um, uh, to uh, the mayor. And, and I have decided to delegate that day-to-day -day authority to the deputy mayor uh, who also, as colleagues know, has responsibilities um, in uh, policing and, and crime. Consistent with that, um, we believe it is right to seek to widen the scope of the police and crime panel, uh, now to include fire as well. Uh, and the single biggest reason why we believe this is the right move to take at this moment in time is, of course, the conclusions of the Kerslake uh, Review which highlighted uh, significant weaknesses in terms of communication between uh, the fire service and, and the police. Uh, and we believe the appropriate response to the seriousness of those recommendations is to make this immediate change so that there is a much broader oversight over all 999 services, but particularly uh, that crucial relationship between uh, police and fire. So we want to broaden the scope of the police uh, and crime panel to include fire, but that will, of course, mean that it's right to disestablish um, the fire uh, committee. So that's the proposal that is set out uh, in the paper. With regard to waste, uh, a similar process has happened whereby um, the functions of the old waste authority have now been transferred to the combined authority. Um, the question arises, should there continue to be uh, a, a committee, uh, given that its uh, functions would no longer be decision-making but advisory? But the proposal I'm putting to the CA today, um, as discussed with leaders, is to keep a waste committee, given the crucial uh, uh, relevance of, of waste at ward level, at neighbourhood level, and the, and the concerns that residents have, and the fact that councillors are, you know, very much um, knowledgeable about um, the way in which uh, waste collection and disposal services are running, um, either to the satisfaction of local residents or otherwise. It's critical, I believe, to have that um, uh, councillor involvement uh, in the way the arrangements for waste in Greater Manchester are being run. So the proposal is to maintain a committee of between 12 and 15 uh, members uh, constituted uh, from the nine authorities who are part of the uh, Greater Manchester waste uh, arrangements, um, that that should be gender balanced, of course, politically proportionate uh, as well, and that we uh, agree at the precise uh, size and the chair of the new waste committee at the June uh, meeting of the combined authority alongside the terms of reference. Uh, finally, transport. There has been a review underway of the governance of transport for Greater Manchester looking at other transport authorities in metropolitan areas <coughs> across uh, the country. Uh, again, the aim of that review is to ensure the right relationship between the CA and transport for Greater Manchester but also to ensure that we are as joined up as possible when it comes to decisions being made at district level and then other transport decisions at the Greater Manchester uh, level. 
Now, we want to ensure that there is, given how, as I was saying before, crucial transport is to our economic success, we want to be sure that we get this uh, decision right, that we take time to, to hear the views that, that colleagues will have uh, across uh, the districts. Um, so the proposal here is that we constitute uh, the committee as is, uh, but that proposals be brought uh, forward uh, shortly uh, after uh, the uh, elections uh, to begin to consider the reconstitution uh, of the uh, TFGM uh, committee uh, and uh, to make uh, suggestions for that, recognising the need, as I say, to improve coordination uh, with, with districts. That will also have to consider the size. There is an indication that we would like to reduce the size of the transport committee, but this, again, is to be determined uh, in, in discussion and consultation with you. So those are the proposals uh, set out uh, in, the, um, uh, in the paper. Of course, this does represent significant change for people, and I, and I recognise, uh, recognise that, but we are in uh, a new reality in terms of um, the accountability the public expect from me as mayor, and I need to be in a position to be able to have arrangements that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, deliver that. Uh, and we believe we've, we've struck the right balance here between improving accountability, strengthening decision making, but as well involving uh, backbench members. And I think it's important for me to point out that as a result of these arrangements, particularly the new scrutiny arrangements, there are actually far more uh, councillors involved in the work of the CA uh, as a result of these arrangements than there were uh, previously. So, would any colleagues like to, uh, to speak on this? If not, can I thank you all for the work you put in uh, to developing uh, these, uh, these arrangements uh, and let's uh, make sure that in putting them into place they also uh, deliver through them the public services uh, that the Greater Manchester public deserves. So thank you very much indeed, uh, colleagues. Item 13, Greater Manchester Skills Capital 2017 to 2020 programme, Sean Anstey. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. So, um, uh, Skills Capital clearly a key part of the uh, skills and employment landscape uh, for uh, Greater Manchester. Uh, we have previously agreed the Trafford and Stockport merger uh, programme, and in round one of this um, Skills Capital uh, programme at the moment, we're asking uh, members today to agree to support applications from Berry College um, for a new Health Innovation STEM Centre and Thameside College for a new Construction Skills Centre. Uh, both um, are third uh, match funding. Um, there's £44.4 million pounds remaining um, if these two um, uh, schemes are approved uh, today. Um, again, the report, there's a part A and part B report, and the recommendations are the same, and I think there was an error in one of the recommendations. It is both Thameside and uh, Berry uh, Colleges that we're asking members to approve. Uh, but it, I think this will be um, more significant progress around making sure that skills capital is deployed across the city region to ensure that all of our facilities are up to scratch, that they're delivering the skills needed for uh, the population of Greater Manchester. Um, and then there's, there is an ongoing process that's described uh, in the report for further phases of skills capital allocation in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Sean. Uh, obviously this is, um, if approved, uh, very um, significant news today uh, for Berry College and Thameside uh, College. But it is only the, the first step, as Sean says, there is significant extra funding to be allocated, which will benefit many other parts of, of Greater Manchester. So this is a you know, crucial part, again, of building our, our, our new approach to skills here. And I'm hoping that colleagues will feel able to give this uh, approval today. I don't know if anybody would like to come in. Rishi, Councillor Rishi Shorey, leader of Berry Council. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Unsurprisingly, I welcome this report, <laughs> not simply because of the investment, however, but because of the focus on a key growth sector for Greater Manchester in terms of health and science innovation. And from the work that we've done, because we're working very closely with the college uh, on this project, we believe this will kickstart a cluster of health and science and technological innovation in terms of business growth within Berry itself, which can only benefit uh, local people, but also local students who get access to top quality 
um, education and open the doors for employment in, in key, key growth areas. So I'm fully supportive of this and uh, hope it will be a very exciting uh, journey <coughs> for Berry College, uh, working with Berry Council. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Wishy. Councillor Brenda Warrington. Uh, likewise, Chair, uh, very much welcome this report and uh, thank uh, the combined authority for their support in uh, taking this forward. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting time for Thameside. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brenda. And uh, on behalf of you all, thanks to Sean for, uh, for overseeing um, this uh, progress. And uh, we look forward to further proposals coming to the combined authority uh, in um, in due course. So uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Item 14, GM Investment Framework uh, Update. Um, this uh, relates to a specific um, uh, funding uh, application by Broughton House for a loan of £3 uh, million. Pounds. And this, the uh, request today to the combined authority that it be given uh, conditional uh, approval uh, and progress subject to due diligence and that authority be delegated to the Treasurer and Combined Authority Monitoring Officer uh, to work out the details. Uh, actually, this is a, a really, I think, a really significant um, uh, proposal that's before us because, as colleagues will know, uh, Broughton House was established in 1916 as a treatment centre for soldiers returning from, uh, from World War I. And it has uh, loyally served um, people who have served our country um, for the 100 years since it was uh, established. Based in Salford, uh, very proudly uh, so, but of course serving people, supporting people from all over Greater Manchester, indeed I, I believe beyond uh, as well. Um, over the years it's evolved into a, a charity and a nursing home um, for veterans, but as colleagues who have visited will know, the current building is unsustainable in its uh, current form. And as a result, the charity are looking to redevelop the site in order to create a, a veterans care village, which actually is, is quite something if we can help them achieve it here in Greater Manchester. It would be, it would be unique, a modern care village uh, supporting our, uh, our veterans. Uh, the proposal, it'd be a, a complex with both a registered nursing facility of 64 beds um, for nursing, dementia and residential care also 24 apartments, predominantly uh, for the over 50s, as well as an armed forces uh, support uh, hub. Um, this uh, would provide a whole, whole range of support uh, of a much higher standard than we are currently able to provide to our ex-forces. And I know that Broughton House are also working uh, to reduce uh, rough sleeping and homelessness uh, amongst um, uh, people within the ex-forces community. They pleased was to give them a, a grant from the Mayor's Homelessness Fund recently in respect of that, of that particular work. But they really are working on, on many levels uh, and I hope um, today this proposal will receive strong support uh, from the combined authority. It's an opportunity for me to mention as well, of course, that we are on, uh, on the eve, really, of our uh, Greater Manchester Armed Forces Summit taking place on the 8th uh, of May. And uh, the aim of that is to... Uh, see if we can become the exemplar for uh, the country in terms of the way uh, we support people in, a, in that same way that Donna was describing, that very person-centred way to give people that, as they leave active service, that range of support that they need across employment, housing, uh, mental health support, whatever it might be. And the summit is, is, is seeking to agree proposals whereby uh, we can uh, credibly claim to, to be providing the best standard of care to our armed uh, forces and I'd like to thank Stephen Pleasant for all the work that he has done with colleagues um, overseeing the arrangements uh, for, the, um, for the summit. Uh, I would like to encourage all boroughs actually to sign up uh, to attend uh, the summit so that we can ensure that we have representation from across the 10 districts. But you know, this is, um, this is really um, excellent, uh, excellent news and it allows a charity that served Greater Manchester well for the last century uh, to do so for the next. Um, and I'd be looking for your support today. Would anybody like to, to comment on this particular item? Paul Dennett. Yeah, um, no surprise that I'm, I'm commenting on it. Absolutely fantastic institution. 
in, in the city of Salford, but it's an institution that serves Greater Manchester, and if anyone's been there, you'll, you'll see why I'm calling it an institution. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'd just like to congratulate them for everything they've done, really, because obviously they've been through a process to, to redesign the facility, and they've also managed to acquire £8 million worth of funding from private donation, fundraising, and a LIBOR grant as well, which, you know, is no easy task. You know, this is an absolutely fantastic facility in the heart of, of Greater Manchester, providing service uh, for, obviously, veterans. But also it's about, you know, that broader community of veterans within Greater Manchester that we want to really support through this institution. And that's why the Armed Forces Support Hub is so, so important. I mean, recently we did some really interesting research at Salford University looking at the lived experiences of veterans once they leave service. And what's quite clear to me is that, you know, th there is further work to be done on this agenda in terms of supporting people within the social services system with housing and, you know, just the general day-to-day -day life when you exit service. And I think, you know, Broughton Hub is going to be an absolute fantastic asset to many of those other organisations operating quite often in the community and voluntary sector and other institutions across Greater Manchester in supporting veterans here within Greater Manchester. So, you know, I welcome this, this development and I'd just like to congratulate them for everything they've done because to get to where they've got has been no easy task. There's been an awful lot of work they've had to do to acquire the funding, to do the designs and get them through through planning and everything. So, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Paul. And uh, I know Salford uh, Council have given given them huge support over the, over the years and um, they wouldn't be where they are without that. There are further details relating to this application uh, set out in the report under the item in Part B. And unless um, uh, colleagues want to raise anything in Part B, I, I suggest we take it all, all now. Just to add, I mean, this creates 39 jobs as well, uh, and that's, uh, that's significant. And it's just an opportunity for me to say, overall, more than £100 million now has been invested by uh, the fund, the Greater Manchester Investment Framework um, uh, Fund, into GM businesses. And it's helped create and safeguard more than 6,000 jobs and support more than, more than 100 businesses since it was established. This is a growing success story, uh, and I would want to place on record my thanks to all of the team at the, um, at the uh, growth company and the GMCA that are working uh, to, um, to, to, to drive uh, this, um, th this valuable support for the GM economy. So, colleagues, can I take it that that's, uh, that's agreed and that we send our good wishes to all at, uh, at Broughton House? Thank you very much. which is Greater Manchester Housing uh, Investment Fund Applications. This is a report from City Mayor of Salford, Paul Dennett, and Steve Rumbelow. Um, there are two items um, listed, but actually only one is coming before you today, and that is the Eccleston Homes uh, Scheme, the Temple Road in Bolton. Um, again, Unless colleagues want to raise any items under Part B, I suggest we take it all uh, at this, uh, this discussion. And I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so there's only one application come forward this time, and that's from Eccleston Home Limited in Bolton. It's for a loan of £3.534 million. Currently, the loan fund sits at £407.1 million. And if we agree this today, that will take it to 410.7 million. This is for 27 residential units. They're all family homes, and it's about accelerating delivery in, in Bolton. And obviously what we heard earlier on the MPPF consultation, accelerating delivery is going to be a key challenge for Greater Manchester moving forward. The homes already have planning permission, and obviously the recommendations before the combined authority today are that the GM Housing Investment Loans Fund in the table below as detailed further in this and the accompanying part B is, is agreed and that recommendation to Manchester City Council that it approves the above and prepares and affects the necessary legal arrangements in accordance with our internal processes. So those are the recommendations before us today. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul. Potentially good news for Bolton, so it's probably right that I invite the leader of Bolton Council, Councillor Linda Thomas, to, to speak. Yes, I, just, just to say thank you, everybody, for supporting this. Um, 
obviously it's 27 houses, but they have only had planning permission for six months. So it's great to see that this company are actually land banking their houses, and this is a this is a way forward. And it will every house will certainly help us towards protecting the green belt, which is really under threat in, in, in Bolton, I suppose, as everywhere else, but in particular in Bolton. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Linda. That, that's right. It's good to see schemes moving forward um, at the pace that we need them to. So uh, can I ask the CA to agree the recommendations? Thank you very much. Item 16, the growth company uh, business plan, which is attached uh, for your information. Uh, and it's uh, also uh, with a report from Sir Richard Lees, uh, setting out the, um, the business plan for the 2018 financial uh, year. So. Richard. I can say very little on, on this, uh, Chair. It, it is uh, essentially here. We're, we're the shareholders of the company, so it is a report to us uh, uh, as shareholders. Uh, I think what I'd like to do, though, is to thank the, uh, the board of the growth company and the members of the advisory panel. These things only work because there are uh, a, a, lo a large number of people, in, uh, starting with Richard Toplis, the chair of the board, and other members who give their time voluntarily uh, to help us deliver uh, for, great, for Greater Manchester. Uh, if there are any questions from members, then uh, Mark Hughes, the group chief executive, is here. Uh, clearly, if they are c of a, a commercial, uh, at least sensitive nature, then uh, we also have the full business plan in Part B, and questions can be asked then. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, are there any questions? Or Mark, would you like to, to say anything in relation to it? If not, um, could I uh, ask that the, uh, the plan be endorsed and uh, on your behalf, thank Mark and his team for the work that they're doing, uh, the growth company, um, in terms of uh, all of the, the support being given to the greater Manchester economy and the success that's been, been achieved. So uh, is that agreed? Thank you very much. Um, there is a further item, uh, colleagues, un that we will take under uh, Part B. Um, which is the capital investment for reinstatement of Rakes Lane Energy uh, Facility. Um, so that concludes. Oh, um, sorry, Jean. Um, just before we go into the closed part of the meeting, I've just become aware that Debbie Abrams has secured an adjournment debate about Shop Direct on the 1st of May. So I think that's, that's progress. Thank you, Jean, and thanks for uh, providing that update because that's something we'll want to support Debbie very much in uh, making sure she's got all the information that, that she needs. So, th so thank you very much uh, for that. So I think that concludes the public uh, part of the, the business, uh, colleagues. And before we finish, I'd just like to thank um, the Interim Chief Fire Officer, uh, Dawn Docks, and all of her team for hosting us here today at the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service Training Centre. Um, I think we can confidently say, I don't know whether the cameras can pick it up, but. Uh, GMFRS are very much uh, signing up to the plastic-free uh, Greater Manchester uh, campaign, so uh, 